Department of Media Study and would like to welcome you to the final presentation in the Plasma Lecture Series. This, I should say, was the inaugural season for the Plasma Lecture Series uh, produced by the Department of Media Study and co-sponsored in various instances. Uh, different lectures were co-sponsored by the Department of English, the Department of Theater and Dance, the Gender Institute, Techne Institute, and I think that covers it, but Techne is, was one of our big sponsors, especially a uh, wonderful partnership that they had with us this, this semester. I would also like to point out that the Plasma Lecture Series, which stands for Performances, Lectures, and Screenings in Media Art, is now going to be presented annually, so every spring you can look for a uh, lineup and very inspiring very eclectic approaches to media, very broadly, and um, we partner with other organizations across campus, so you'll see those kind of thematics um, interwoven in a very interdisciplinary way. So we welcome you, and I'm going to pass the mic to my esteemed colleague, Tony Conrad, but before I do, I just would like to say that it was Tony's brainchild to create Plasma, and he gave it, he christened it Plasma, he had the whole concept. And he also spoke to it with some of his discussion on this Well, <laughs> it's really wonderful to have seen such a season um, that has been full of variety and interest. And I think next spring we'll do it again. But um, I'm particularly appreciative uh, for many reasons that um, we are able today to welcome my super good friend, Tony Arsler. So, it's good. Thanks, Tony. Yeah. Well, that was a beautiful introduction. <laughs> the friendship part was, you know, dear to my heart. Uh, and it's true. I think we met each other, what, 1980? Uh, 80. 80. That's a long time ago. As short, as early in the 80s as you can get. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, uh, that was what in San Diego, yeah. anyway. I'm not going to digress into that. Well, I'll be digressing a lot, but uh, I'll throw a few anchors out. Uh, I thought how cool it is to be here um, in Buffalo, where you know this city. Uh, there's another Tony here, uh, Tony Bellani. All right, and uh, Ted. Uh, you know, this city it was really important to me because of Hall Walls, because of Media Study Buffalo, because of uh, the university, and also because of the falls. Uh, but basically, uh, as you may or may not know, uh, as with plasma, is still happening today. Back a long time ago, in the 80s and on, there was a, a um, my, this part of a migration route, uh, specifically, uh, due to the support of, of uh, alternative media and performance, video, film, music, that kind of thing, through that access. And the names of, uh, of the participants are uh, varied and, uh, and definitely a rich history, which I'm sure everyone here is familiar with, with the archives. Uh, where's the... Uh, Mike Kelly video archived? Hall Walls. Hall Walls. Uh, yeah, so people, when people have a chance, there's even such amazing um, <coughs> documents that are so rare and so wonderful that they're even slightly controversial, mm -hmm. like, the, uh, like the Mike Kelly uh, performance from 1981, mm -hmm. two, one, yeah. two, one, one or two? Who knows? Uh, 81. And you uh, probably heard of Mike Kelly 
you probably know that he passed away. And uh, you probably also know that he has a big survey show traveling around the world. But um, one missing link in that show was a video documentation of his rare and early performances, uh, which he was very shy about recording, but he allowed one recording to be made of those performances. And that was done right here in, uh, in Hall Walls. And it's so controversial, it's not been allowed in his survey show, which I've seen in uh, Amsterdam, Paris, New York, and I haven't seen yet in LA, but it's not included, much to my chagrin. But you guys can see it. So uh, that, I thought, was a good way to introduce, you know, the kind of deep history here. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and show an early tape of mine from uh, California Institute from the Arts, for the Arts, uh, in, let's see, I think it was 1976 or 7, uh, around in there, one of the first tapes that I, uh, I'm gonna just see how the technical side of this goes. So I guess we could dim the lights, bring the sound up a little bit, and. Um, to get, uh, make this a multimedia thing here and see if I can't go between one thing and the next. Uh, so I, I just show that, that tape to uh, give an idea of my super early videos, which, uh, you know, I started out as a painter and a sculptor, I guess, as a teenager, was really drawn to, um, to art after, uh, I guess, being kind of a, what I thought was like a failed scientist or something. And uh, uh, I, it, so that was like my fallback position was art. And I never felt like the paintings quite uh, coalesced into what I wanted them to. And uh, of course, at CalArts, I got introduced to the porta pack which was the first uh, portable video player, recorder player. And 
you know, just to give it context for you guys, it'll be strange uh, to think that, you know, I was at my first year in college and I had never seen a uh, video recorder ever. So when I was introduced to that, it was already 10 years old, uh, the, the technology, but I'd never seen one or played with one. I mean, uh, up close anyway. So being a, of the kind of TV generation, uh, you know, I immediately transposed um, my painting ideas and the narrative involved with that and into a kind of video space. And I really thought that it was, for me, it was revolutionary to be able to set up a video camera and sort of paint while I was looking at the TV in a kind of closed circuit setup. I started making these uh, sets and kind of tableaus like that with simple actions. And they got more and more elaborate. And uh, then uh, at a certain point, um, you know, I was obviously looking at a lot of influences like the German expressionist uh, filmmakers and then um, thinking a lot about theater space as well as, um, as well as some of the very early, early filmmakers like George Méliès, who I was looking at at the same time, and uh, some of the anonymous films that were very first made. And I often thought that films split in the early days and one side went to a kind of a, to the verite of documentary and, and Lumiere brothers went out and shot the factory uh, facade and the workers coming out and uh, Méliès of course went right into a big dark space and started making the same kind of magic visions he was making before. So that cross-section of, uh, of you know, the beginning of, of uh, a kind of transition from uh, one kind of space to another space, moving image has been important to me. Anyway, I'm gonna show an excerpt of, of a video that I'm sure you can see here somewhere, Evol. And uh, as you might have noticed, that's love spelled backwards. <laughs> and uh, that was made right here in, for the most part, in uh, Buffalo. Um, for I don't know how many months I was here in the uh, old Elks Lodge, I guess it was. Am I right, Tony? Was the, that uh, Mars Hotel? Mars Hotel. Yeah. And um, the media study Buffalo. Yeah, it was a fantastic building. I think seven stories high, the top few I stories. Don't know how many stories. <laughs> top top few stories were had rotted out and uh, they no longer existed. It was slowly rotting from the top down, and the bottom was in good shape. And uh, so uh, I'll show this. This features uh, this scene features. Let's see, um, Mike Kelly uh, and Tony Conrad and uh, my brother. Mark Aursler and numerous other characters. Uh. Okay, I'll say that word and I'd like you to say the first thing that comes to your mind. Battleship. Road. Poison. Um, car. Flight. Dog. Uh, play. Turn that the down school, a little bit. The high school play. Mark Horton 
than anything in the world. This Mark had this naked closed word. We'd take the nectar that from the flowers and squeeze it out, and then we'd pelt Mark with the nectar. It has to try in somewhere, a legend of coffee and wine. Their bodies first killed animals and people when they drank from its waters. And later, a sickly sweet smell came from the swamp gas in flavoring plain pads. Some say they can still hear their voices in the gentle laughing of waves on the shore. And some say they can still hear the screams in the ice cloud melting in the spring. The pouty rocks are his fur, and the turtles are her own. <laughs> So, uh, <clears throat> so the the early videos that I'm showing here, like they they weren't really mastered that well, for, <laughs> authored for this piece, but uh, very well for this documentation. So they're a little bit fuzzy, but they actually look a little bit better than that. Um, anyway, that was a half an hour tape um, from let's see. I'm going to pause this for one second. The evil was like roughly a half an hour long, and it went on sort of like that. Like I was trying to make uh, as many um, edits in camera in the sense that we built these large settings, so small and large sets in, in this big sound stage at Media Study. So we could have, you know, one, one set would be as big as this room, and then another set would be, you know, as big as this, and the camera would pan from one to the other and have these actions take place. So uh, it was a kind of fantasy for me. I don't think I ever attempted another tape that elaborate. Uh, but anyway, uh, around that time, actually before that, um, this piece uh, that I'm going to show very dark documentation of was at the kitchen in uh, New York and it's called L7, L5 and the title refers to uh, a kind of slang from the 50s. L7 meant you were a square uh, which people probably don't know what a square is but that was kind of like <laughs> a nerd. Uh, and, and L5 refers to the, to the uh, space between the moon and the earth where something will, an object will stay in, in, in uh, orbit forever, theoretically. And uh, so at, at that time I was really thinking about, fit, you know, these large elaborate sets that I was making, but also kind of turning them inside out and trying to make a sculpture that also had video in it in different ways and had moving image. So I'm just going to let this play in the background while I talk about it. Um, I left the sound off of this. Uh, the, so what I was doing was taking, um, you know, uh, I guess, taking monitors and using them in different ways. So here was a kind of inverted flagpole. Um, you see everything is kind of made of cardboard and clay a lot like the sets I was making for the videotapes. And this was a kind of glass house, uh, excuse the camera work, but, and then inside the structure of the house is pr broken glass. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, whoops, I hope that starts in the same spot. Anyway, uh, so L7, L5 was, you know, it was important to me because it was a kind of, I was, in terms of combining language, uh, performance, sculpture, and moving image, and to uh, some degree sound, and making immersive environments was something that um, from that time on through the 80s into the early 90s was really important to me, sort of pre-projection stuff. And what, for that piece, what I did was, uh, uh, took an ad out in the newspaper uh, and looking for somebody who had first-hand encounters with uh, UFOs or aliens 
and I had was fixated on this idea that you know science fiction had been kind of destroyed by uh, people like Spielberg mm -hmm. and uh, Star Wars and things like this, Lucas, uh, and that you know it, it had been a kind of uh, interesting philosophical. Um, um, creative pop cultural force in literature with people like Philip K. Dick and like that, and then became kind of cowboys and Indians in, in cinema. And so I, I kind of uh, interviewed a woman who was visited by uh, aliens, and uh, she appears reflected in the glass house and uh, wrote various other sequences uh, and did some deconstructions of uh, of the Star Wars um, uh, items that were for sale at the time. So I got some kids playing with um, some of the spin-off products of uh, Hollywood. Anyway, that just gives you a taste of, of the way that piece looked. And uh, for lack of time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, can we turn this down? So I'm gonna just talk right over this. Um, this, this is uh, jumping forward into the 90s, um, a piece at Documenta uh, 9, I believe it was, in 1991, uh, and the piece called The Watching, which was installed in the staircase of the building called the Friedrichianum in uh, Kassel, Germany. So there was a kind of eye synchronized on this, uh, this burning effigy in the hall. And the idea was that as he moved up and down the, uh, the staircase, you know, that it was a really dynamic kind of installation space that you would encounter these characters. I did my first uh, kind of head projections in that show, uh, which was a kind of changing point for my career. And there were these capsules, uh, kind of characters of these uh, denuded human forms uh, <laughs> stuffed into these glass capsules. So uh, I was kind of equating uh, a lot of, s s um, equating the <laughs> viewing um, kind of sex and violence implicit in the uh, spectacle of, of television and, and cinema and um, the way thinking a lot about the way the human form um, evolves. Uh, so then a little bit after that, things simplified with these small pieces. Here's a, I would hire an actress to, uh, let me pause for one second hired an actress to uh, come in, Tracy Leipold, to come to my studio and uh, cry for the camera. Um, because I, I was kind of interested in, in, in a very simple way of deconstructing narrative, uh, narrative uh, into, you know, I'd always been interested in the single channel videos of making non-linear narratives and kind of scrambling that up and reading people like Burroughs and thinking about the cut-up technique. And then uh, around this time, I, I started thinking, well, you know, it'd be interesting to just dissect it even further and say, like, okay, if, if people are attracted to the emotions of, of actors and actresses and they have this kind of empathic bond, um, what would happen if you just isolated uh, these, these kind of feats of empathy that performers could generate and put them into these kind of uh, electronic effigies. So projecting on these faces became, uh, faces onto these dummies and dolls became a really big, uh, important aspect of my work in the early 90s and for the next years after that. So starting out with the small pieces and then vacillating into the the bigger installations because there's always a kind of push and pull in my work of, of concentrating uh, and, and simplifying and then also tending to making to kind of elaborate uh, things like uh, hopelessly 
to the point of um, uh, trying to express, I guess, in, impossible uh, ideas in art. So this particular piece I'm going to show here, Judy, um, was a kind of line across the space and equated uh, the notion of multiple personality disorder and the fractured self with, uh, with kind of ten, uh, tendencies uh, in, in pop culture. Um, starting, like looking at the Three Faces of Eve, uh, which came out in 1957, and then um, the notion that uh... <laughs> so then there's a kind of variation, you know, one one figure is kind of choking the other, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can't hear it, but she's going. So this one had a kind of Frankensteinian <laughs> quality to it. Yeah, so maybe you're going to have to ride the sound here for me because. Um, you want to look at that again? Here, maybe you can. So as I was, I was mentioning about Judy, uh, some of these more. Just if you could go to the, if you could go to the beginning of that one, um, the piece called Judy, which was a diagonal. I never. Oh, all right. You, you gotta, you gotta fast forward through that. Why don't you turn it down while we're doing that? Um, see, digital stuff. It's digital. So it's hard to use at certain <laughs> points. It's you know digitality. It's like on or off. So that's why either it's really easy or it's really hard <laughs> at any given moment. Uh, so back to Judy, uh, the the piece arranged in a kind of diagonal. Um, it, at one point, you could sit in the piece and um, you could. Uh, you could you could go over to the to the organ play, but anyway, it kind of arranged in this long line. The idea is that there was a kind of uh, a fractured character. In other words, the notion of uh, having uh, yeah, you could just pause there. Thank you. Having multiple aspects of of one person uh, in one consciousness. There's a kind of history of that in psychology and also uh, somehow thinking about the mimetic structures of, uh, of the multimedia world uh, as, a, as a kind of extension of, of a collective consciousness and, and a sort of expansion of, of that tendency to uh, be able to change in a way that would go against, say, the Freudian archetype of character and to go more into the kind of Jungian um, dialogue with the unconscious uh, that's implied in the Red Book uh, was what that piece is about. So I always think that that piece really had to do with the kind of transition from, from pre-television to the internet um, and that uh, the internet is a kind of uh, end result of 
you know, start, if you could say start television at one point was just two channels or three channels or zero channels and then moving further into cable and then after cable, uh, you know, you have satellite augment, augmenting it and uh, then finally the internet where everything is two way and then along the way what happens to our, our identity is that it kind of becomes on the one hand, uh, the, you know, people would say that there was a kind of destruction and a um, fracturing of the character, but then on the other hand, there's a kind of liberation and, and uh, multiplicity, uh, a kind of fluid ability to change our character. And uh, so that piece was really important to me, and it's something I think about in terms of, uh, of truth and uh, identity in the age of the internet. But, so then now I'm gonna play this, uh, I think, or I'm gonna stop it. There it is. This is Constance De Jong as uh, one organ and myself as a... Stay up here when I say turn it down, then we'll just turn it down and then up, up. So, uh, so this one, you, uh, also around this time, I started thinking about um, what really constitutes um, what really constitutes the moving image and. Uh, and I started thinking, well, okay, if it's really just light and sound, you know, you really don't need all this pictures moving around telling the story. You know, you just need the light and you just need the sound. And uh, maybe some language would be good. And uh, let the light and sound kind of paint, you know, like paint the space around it. And so I came up with this idea of a, of a talking light, which you'll see appear uh, couple of times here. And this is in San Diego and the, the sound is in the museum, but also we put the speakers on the outside of the museum so you can hear it in, in the landscape. <laughs> so, Moving along, um, as you can see, I was really uh, continuing to be fascinated with um, taking a projection screen and forming it into a kind of 3D space. And this, this exhibition, simply titled Eyes, um, for me had to do with the kind of uh, isolation and togetherness that's implied by watching just as you're sitting in this room together we're together but then we're somehow separated at the same time uh, and there's a kind of conflict implied in that relationship that that just is recursive and uh, a kind of infinite and I reflect that in the actual eyes of the of these characters, uh, disembodied characters. So you see a small image inside the eye there of what each character was watching. And uh, so, it, so it's something that I kind of returned to over the years, you'll see. I have actually a, a piece related to this up in Germany right now. And this one here is uh, Kristen Lucas. She's looking at an old Atari. So some of these are, uh, 
Joe Gibbons uh, looking at pornography and um, <laughs> Kiki Smith in a kind of trance state and different friends, uh, fellow artists uh, who came to the studio. There you can see the old video game. So they became a kind of record of what the, uh, my preoccupations were at the time and also what the technology was at the time. So at this time, like it, as I mentioned, it's Atari video games and so forth, but you'll see some happening later. Um, you could turn that up a little bit. Oh. This is in Sweden, in Wana Sculpture Park. And I like to show this documentation because it reminds me of a Magritte. Uh, These are fantasies which become a reality. It will escalate. It will blow up into light. Your viewers, your viewers, your viewers may not want to know. A sudden drastic change in personality. What happened? Visibly altered states of awareness. A reality within a reality, within a reality, within a reality. Impaired reasoning or decision making. So that, that piece, um, not sure what the Swedes thought of it, but uh, <laughs> just dawned on me, maybe they didn't even speak English, but um, <laughs> might be better. Uh, you know, the language aspect of the pieces is something I've been thinking about a lot recently because I just put out a uh, book of collected texts from over 30 years, a kind of selection of them. And it was really like going to the psychiatrist uh, in a big way uh, for me. And um, uh, this, this particular work I like to talk about because uh, it's pretty emblematic of the way I go about researching a project. So with that one, I was really fascinated by the Hale-Bopp cult and, um, and kind of magical thinking and how people um, go from uh, your average uh, American to believing that they're going to be picked up by a, a ship in the tail of a comet, you know, and they need to leave their body, leave the husk of their body. So, uh, you know, it was a, so then it, these kind of, I guess it comes from growing up uh, Catholic, which, I thought was really good training as an artist to have a kind of system of, of philosophical thought and a belief system that might not be shared by everybody. And, um, you know, that also I, I take, take that uh, into art making and I take that kind of, the, the notion of a leap of faith is something like with L7, L5 and the woman who believed she had met aliens um, and, and the hale Bob cult uh, as, as a kind of, you know, at a certain point you could kind of replace some of the verbs and adjectives and you'd come up with the same text that, uh, for instance, Kandinsky might have written about his painting. And so I always kind of equated these kind of leaps of faith with um, with art making and creativity and and uh, and the you know direction of action, whether it be positive or negative. Um, well, 
this work, I'm going to keep this kind of quiet because there's a, there's a, um, no, I'm actually going to just pause this right here, or I'm going to let it play. <laughs> So, uh, okay, so you, you got the, uh, the setting here. We're going to call that the establishing shot. Uh, <laughs> it's Madison Park. It's uh, October. It's chilly. It's actually Halloween. Uh, and it's uh, the year 2000. And um, so after two years of research and, uh, and kind of, fantasizing about what could happen with my work out in, in a public space. I'm always fascinated with how things, you know, trying to get art out of the ivory tower and trying to take it to the street uh, in different ways. Um, I was working with the Public Art Fund in New York and also uh, Art Angel in London on um, how to take some projections outdoors and um, <clears throat> but the real question uh, often the way I work is that I'll, I'll get involved in research and uh, then out of the research comes the ideas and then the practicality of it kind of decides what can be done so uh, a lot of it, exhibitions happened before this that related to, I think I'll just say very quickly, the eyes uh, that kind of took me into like maybe a three or four year uh, journey into the history of the moving image because I, I, I was thinking a lot about the eye as a camera obscura. And for some reason, right around that time, I was thinking about um, okay, the history, and this is kind of germane to media study, the history, the parallel history of the moving image and the still image or, or kind of classical art versus multimedia art. And um, so strangely, the eye, the notion of the eye um, and the fact that it is a camera obscura. Do people know what a camera obscura is? Most people, yeah, well, I'll just explain it briefly. It's any chamber, any dark chamber, which is separated by an aperture from a light chamber, which uh, causes an image to be projected in, in an inverted state into the dark chamber. So the light passes from the light space into the dark space, from outside of your head into your head through this aperture of the pupil. And, at that time, I was thinking, well, it's, you know, I was able to do a lot of work uh, all around the world, and I thought, this is interesting. I thought nobody would ever be interested in media art, that it was always going to be like a kind of parallel uh, experience that was delegated to places like media study and stuff like that, and that it would never really be accepted into the art world. But uh, it had been around, uh, around 1991, it was uh, allowed into, into the bigger art world, at least in my life. And um, I would say, if you look back, uh, that would be the kind of, the exhibition uh, documenta at that time was Gary Hill, Dara Birnbaum, uh, Matt Barney, um, and numerous others, Katie Nolan, were all in that exhibition. And it was kind of the first time that the art world was like, okay, we're going to let these moving image, this stuff that plugs in, we're going to let it into the gallery, we're going to let it mix it in with the rest of the art world. And I started thinking around that time, okay, it, it's been accepted, but uh, what about the historical side of it? Um, you know, there really is no history uh, for the media artist that I could accept really in the way that there was a kind of detailed history. There's a film history, okay, that's really detailed, and there's somewhat of a kind of, a little bit of uh, MIT-ish kind of stuff happening in the 60s, but what about the deep history, you know? Was there, since we know that the camera obscura uh, is, a, is a concept that's quite old, maybe there were people making um, 
moving image a long time ago, and we just don't know about them in the same sense that kinetic art uh, might be left in the basement of a museum because it doesn't work anymore. It's kind of ephemeral in the same way that performance art couldn't be documented at certain times. So uh, just for myself, I started, you know, being a, an artist and not an intellectual. I started researching uh, a little bit of this history myself. I, I, you know, it was before the internet, I'll say, or right at the cusp of the internet. So it was not easy like today. I could do what I have, was doing then much quicker, which was to kind of look at, to kind of construct a timeline of the moving image for myself. And I started with the earliest notions of, uh, of the moving image, which was the camera obscura, the first known at that time. It could change. That's the thing is these histories always change. But the first mention of the camera obscura was like, the year 1000 in China. And interestingly enough, there was a poem about the camera obscura and how, uh, and by the way, it was always, uh, the camera obscura was always connected to architecture in some way. So, because you had to have a dark space and a light space. And so as soon as we built spaces, they could be dark and the light would be able to come in. So the poem, uh, then I'm referring to, it talks about a pagoda and the light coming in the pagoda and seeing a, a man's face inverted on, on the wall inside the pagoda and uh, in China. And, um, you know, there's something about the inversion so of the man's face and the personality uh, of, the, of the character of the man being inverted so that somehow which is, I thought was just fantastic because the very first kind of moving image, not only does it connect to uh, architecture and installation, but it also connects to a kind of psychological property, like another side of the human. And um, so I built this timeline pretty much for myself as research for this outdoor project. And, um, I started finding out about the magic lantern and, you know, thinking about, well, why couldn't we also include uh, x-ray into that because, you know, endoscopy, the idea of looking inside the body and all these different other ways, science, in other words, science is always left out side of uh, the art making process, even though I think artists are always looking at it. And so I started kludging together this timeline. You can find it on my website. And um, that was a way of like falling into a, a, a hole of art history or pseudo art history. And then I was trying to desperately climb my way back out of the hole because I found that in that history, it was really fascinating to learn about, you know, Thomas Edison, did he actually create a machine where he thought he could talk to the dead through uh, this telephone or this machine, or was that an apocryphal machine? Uh, and all this sort of thing. And then, as probably you're feeling right now, your eyes are kind of rolling up in your head, and you're going, yeah, that's interesting, but maybe it's not shared by all of us. Uh, and so a lot of my projects, which I haven't shown you here, different installations, had to do with kind of aspects of that history that I was fascinated with. But I felt like, you know, I really um, consider myself an artist who is in the vernacular of the moment, or I try to be if I can. And uh, this kind of, you know, the necessary text around these art historical projects tends to alienate the viewer and kind of short circuits the immediate quality of uh, appreciating art. So this was a kind of dilemma that I had. So at one point I was sit, like identifying this territory of, of the moving image through history, which I thought of as really a kind of shadow history. And it was really exciting. But I thought, you know, my art is suffering because of this. Like people are just, they think you've really lost it, you know, and you're explaining like, well, did you know in 1720 that uh, this Italian performance group, you know, did a satanic ritual and uh, 
like that. So uh, anyway, I was kind of, you know, I, I just was determined to put that behind me, but not to abandon it, to just kind of cap it off. So I kind of wrote the uh, kludge together, the timeline. And then out of that, I was like, okay, the timeline's done. What's the value of it besides it being a timeline and, and being fascinating in itself? And I thought, um, the, the, the comment that for me that was important was uh, that <clears throat> there's a kind of alternative history, just like there's an alternative space here of uh, media study that you know, projects which are accepted or not accepted uh, happen there, and that that's how culture is built on these failures and successes. And um, to identify with the failures to some degree can be just as exciting as the successes. So the influence machine, uh, the title is an obscure title, but fascinating. And I'll tell you about it. Uh, there's a, uh, there was a, uh, a fellow, uh, uh, there was a kind of pop phenomenon in the, I believe, the, the 1700s in, in England and around Europe where glass spheres were made uh, and, and um, vacuum, made into vacuums and they were spun rapidly on a suspension device. And once uh, they were spun and they, a certain cloth was rubbed against it, the sphere would glow. So I thought, ah, the influence machine, what was it used for? Well, it had real, really no purpose except that it fascinated people because it was a glowing sphere which they had never seen before. So they had to codify it. What would they do? Well, they would have sex underneath it in hopes that it would um, change the way they had sex. Uh, this is one thing that was done around the influence machine and uh, other things as well. So it was a kind of uh, a charged, pun intended, uh, object that became the title of this piece. But you could say that, it, you know, vacuum tube glowing, couldn't you say that it was maybe the beginning of television in the 1700s? <laughs> yes, you could. Yes, you could. So that's the title of that piece. And in other words, uh, television would have been founded on numerous uh, fascinating inventions or ex cultural excursions that failed and that we ignore and we laugh at, but then you didn't really laugh at, um, at, 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 at the young boy in Iowa who looked at the rows of corn and said, oh, if we would arrange um, uh, moving images on a screen uh, just in the same way that we plant the, uh, the rows of corn and use the NIPCO disk to kind of to dissect the image, uh, then we could have a phosphorescing screen, you know. That was ludicrous, but it did eventually, uh, Philo T. Farnsworth did uh, invent television by looking at rows of corn. So anyway, uh, the influence machine, um, it was a kind of roundup of that. And what, uh, what uh, the, the research that came to mind uh, triggered by Jeffrey Sconce's article uh, about something, uh, I can't remember, sorry Jeffrey, the exact title of it, but it has to do with uh, the telegraph to the dead. Uh, tipped me off, you know, at that time I had already been into the spirit photography, and then, you know, the tele it, of course the telegraph is just a wonderful collapsing of space, the very first uh, uh, time that people were ever able to communicate instantaneously over time and forever change the world. But at the same time, in um, 1848, in upstate New York, um, a, a small uh, a, a family of girls, the uh, Fox sisters, began the New American Spiritualist Movement, was, was analogous to the uh, Morse code, the tapping of the Morse code. They uh, heard an alphanumerical tapping in their bedroom and were able to uh, decode it into uh, voices from the other side. And this began a small, but probably a few million followers of uh, spiritualism and uh, what became the uh, uh, spiritual telegraph, which had important social ramifications because of the, uh, uh, 
the locating of the um, of the religious ceremony in in uh, private groups, also allowing women to be uh, the center of those groups for the first time, maybe or one of the first times, and also. Uh, I took it as a connective device for this piece. Uh, so I began to look around at the way that when a technology uh, is born, it has to be codified, just like the internet when it was first born. Uh, no one really knew what to do with it, and they're still figuring it out. Uh, unfortunately, it's things like Facebook, uh, Titans. Uh, but, you know, when, fa when uh, uh, it, so in other words, rock and roll and amplified music, you know, was called the devil's music. Uh, you say photography, when it came about, it was first considered uh, to, uh, to be a way that you could photograph um, spirits. Uh, uh, film and television also had certain occult characteristics. And I thought to kind of knit those things together, the telegraph, the uh, photograph, um, cinema, television, and then of course you could find the use of the internet as uh, people using electronic uh, and, and propagating um, kind of seance activities and, and spreading um, electronic voice phenomena and things like that. So I took uh, that as a starting point, um, not because I'm interested in the, in the occult per se, but that I'm interested in the way that, that these technologies are codified and that, they're, that they are up for grabs when they're first invented. And that um, I relate to that as, a, as an artist and um, I also, know that the way that we got to uh, where we are technically and culturally today is, is based on these kind of as many failures as successes. So um, I'm, on that note, I'm going to show this piece, I hope. As I said, it was going to be a little bit of a mouthful. Uh, so you could turn that up a little bit. So these characters kind of channel some of the characters I was talking about um, relating to the Phantasmagoria, um, relating to Farnsworth and television. And this is uh, Tony's soundtrack here. Tony Conrad's soundtrack. Some of this is found text from the internet, kind of spirit text. So it was on for 10 days in New York and then 10 days in London.
That's a flat iron building over there. Who's there? So the image kind of spread out onto some of the buildings around the edge of the park, Madison Park in New York. And, um, and this is a kind of a poor video, but of a large, I don't know, it's maybe 10 story high Peter Zunther building in Bregenz, Austria. And we use the surface of that building uh, to project these kind of four shuffling heads. And the building is kind of covered with this wonderful um, glass at face uh, Lake Constance. And the text is sort of about um, what happens to, or what might happen to, uh, to a signal when it's transmitted, kind of inspired by the fact that this is a very, um, a country with, with three or four borders. <clears throat> by the way, the speakers I used for this have been used by the Pope. <laughs> I was very proud of that. They're special speakers, really long, thin like a horn, which projected these voices across uh, the landscape. If you look very carefully, I think, oh well. Uh, so then shifting scale, uh, these are the kind of very end, I would say, of the use of antennas uh, kind of inspired me for this gallery exhibition, kind of continuing this idea of what happens, uh, what's lost and what's gained in, in transmission. And so this exhibition was kind of a contemplation of that. Uh, This is Metro Pictures and And so there was another component of this that was a kind of characters that existed on the floor. These kind of glass pods. Very science fiction looking. So there's like a it's not easy to see, but there's a kind of egg shape suspended in a, in a large glass kind of pour, almost like a, an envelope of glass. So the kind of refraction off the edge of the glass really became a big part of, the, of these pieces. I love to experiment with the materials. Um, 
and the kind of punty that broke in glass there. People know about glass making. Um, so I threw this in. I, I put a bunch of eyes in this tape just to show how I kind of like to return to pieces over time. And um, this were large kind of translucent uh, eyes. And you could see the scale of them. This is at the Cartier Foundation in Paris. And I worked with the Yanomami tribe in, um, in the um, Amazon on this project and uh, incorporated a lot of their imagery into this. Their drawings that they that they made, and <clears throat> kind of fascinated with the notion that they had these uh, sh shamanistic storytellers who tranced out in the um, in their villages and went into these. Uh, <clears throat> kind of hypnotic narrative states. The installation that really caught our eye was this. <laughs> could turn this off just a little bit. Just a hair. How, I asked artist Tony Arsler, would he advise our audience to experience his work? Just take a look. One half of the conversation. And um, the viewer is envisioned as the other half of the conversation. Hauschler's part of the dialogue is subversive children's rhymes, an attempt to trigger the subversive child in the viewer. I hate you. You hate me. I got a machine gun to kill Barney. One big shot. Barney's on the floor. This is Barney the PBS puppet, right? Yeah, the puppet. So then there you have you know, these kids kind of figuring out different ways to kill this thing that's being shoved down their throat, you know, as a, as a kind of corporate package. Pull the trigger, hit him in the head, oopsie daisy, Barney's dead. Arasler says he wants to break the hypnotic trance of commercial culture, even on non-commercial TV, with something subversive that asks viewers to participate. These particular texts are, um, they're not exactly childish, you know, they're, they're actually kind of intense and uh, violent, sexual, uh, so that was kind of the idea with these heads, kind of detached heads in a way, kind of echoing to one another through time and space, different variations on these, uh, on these poems. As you can see, Arsler answered my oh-so-serious questions with serious answers. But he thought I was missing the essential fun of it all. So I played along in a demonstration of his craft. First, he videotapes a face within a black frame. When I'm looking at your exhibit, what do you expect me to be doing? I read a statistic once the average museum goer spends about 1.5 seconds in front of each painting. Then he plays back the tape onto a molded head. Uh, people will spend two hours in a Hollywood movie that you could sum up in uh, 10 seconds. So I think it's, it's a matter of priorities and uh, a different way of looking at time, really. Yeah, but movies <laughs> have a vocabulary, a set of conventions that we're already familiar with, whereas with new artists and works of art, you've got to, as an act of faith, learn their vocabulary, enter into their worlds, and you don't know what the payoff's going to be. I disagree. I think that most Hollywood movies uh, induce in the viewer a hypnagogic uh, trance, a drug-like state, and that culturally art might be difficult in the beginning, but eventually it's a lot more playful experience than I think you're, you're letting on. If you had to state a sort of overall purpose for your work, would you say it's to break the hypnotic trance that we're in as a result of this culture? <laughs> that would be good if the Whitney Biennial could do that. <laughs> <laughs> brought us back to the Biennial for one last concern. 
<laughs> when we were at the Whitney, we had to leave some of our TV gear alone for much of the day. Some museum goers had taken to contemplating it as yet another exhibit. <laughs> when the show, a nearby guard answered their questions. Is that a piece of artwork? I says, yes, it is. What is the title? I says, it's on title. <laughs> Critics of art have put forth such instances as evidence that aesthetic judgment has become random. But Tony Ausler had a completely different response. I love that story. I mean, I, I, it's just incredible if people could have that, take that attitude with them out, out of a museum into their daily lives. You mean they could look at the world as if it were all art? For a time, anyway. Whoops. Oh. I'm not sure if that. Some really nice experimental music coming into that. Um, <laughs> uh, so. This, this particular group of, uh, oh yeah, that's better. I mean, that could be on the soundtrack, I don't know. We'll see. Um, around, oh, I kind of like it, but uh, the, around this time I, uh, you know, I thought, I. I wanted to make some work that I thought would be uh, humorous and a little bit op more optimistic than some of my pieces. I just uh, had had my uh, son Jack, and um, oh, there's Tony Conrad again. <laughs> Looking sharp. <laughs> uh, and. And so I, I made it in a kind of a playful series of uh, characters that took, oh, pause, pause that for one second. Oh, I think we got uh, something, audio went sideways. Um, well, I'll talk while he, he's trying to fix the audio. Do you want to like, I'll, That's, maybe we should reboot. You guys ever reboot? <laughs> See, we are in the dark, you know, on-off phase of, uh, that sound right? Maybe. Yeah. You could crank that. Uh, crank it. Crank it! <laughs> That's Frank Black.
right? That was um, <laughs> that was David Bowie and his 50th birthday party at Madison Square Garden, and um, so I did I had the good fortune to do uh, the um, some of the settings for that show, which was really a thrill. So uh, I I met him in the in '96. I guess, and then a year or so later, he asked me if we could do, uh, if I'd be interested in, you know, letting him use some of my motifs in his show. Of course, I couldn't refuse, and um, <laughs> so I traded him. I said, well, if you came and did some performances in the studio, you know, yeah, you can, you can use some of that, and he agreed, and we've been friends ever since, and uh, so I like to show that that particular piece, so he did, you know, where he took uh, one of the characters onto the stage there, and he toured it around um, through the years, the dummies and dolls, and then, I don't know if people saw that, but then uh, he released a new album about in last, uh, a year ago, um, where we did a video together, which I don't have here, but you can see it on online. Um, then I'm doubling back to uh, <clears throat> uh, Is it kind of I guess you could bring it up a little bit more but the uh, so this was at the, a very small museum in Long Island piece uh, that I really enjoyed making because the way that it, it just interrupted people um, during the day walking down this little town, uh, the street in this little town in the, in, the, in the Hamptons. That's the Parish Art Museum. This is a piece in um, Australia uh, projecting on a, on a fountain and continuing to kind of play with the idea of invading uh, the park, uh, a kind of public space in different ways. And um, Tony also worked on the soundtrack for this one. And, and the idea was another kind of sci-fi theme that the, the park was kind of invaded by a sort of uh, <laughs> these colors. I'm not sure whether it was a good piece or not, but um. so it was really a kind of sound and light show.
Something to shoot upon in Paris. The piece called The Sixth Wall. <clears throat> which it really had to do with the idea of architecture and, um, and the moving image and kind of turning that space inside out. So we're uh, getting closer to today in the, uh, there's Tony, I'm gonna keep pointing Tony out. <laughs> doing a, these pieces that I called kind of fugues uh, that kind of combine sculpture, found objects, um, and a, a series of overlapping characters. So I'm thinking about a cast of characters that um, almost like if you were able to download your your life history in some way um, and take the archetypes uh, from your fantasy, from your reality, from your dreams and, uh, and aspirations and kind of recombine them in different ways. Um, so they're really, these pieces for me were kind of a way of taking these characters and rearranging them in different ways. Um, and I began to shoot many different performers and performances um, from different points of view and then recombining them and editing, kind of elaborate. <clears throat> um, I thought of them really as kind of fugue states in some way. Um, <clears throat> and that the sculpture would be as important as, you know, the frozen images would be as important as the animated images. So these are like computer printouts with, mixed with uh, metal, glass, pigmented glass, uh, and then, you know, also resin forms. I, I was really interested in um, trying to work also with untrained sculptors. So I, I had a number of people that I worked with uh, well, there's some paintings in this exhibition with video embedded in them. Uh, so I've worked with kind of untrained sculptors making certain aspects of these pieces that would then be cut up and recombined. Um,
That's me in chains up there. See the image quality gets a little better too with HD. You notice how that like it's wider and clearer. <laughs> Yeah, the sound is not great on here, but there's a kind of balance between the sound and the, uh, and the animations and the poetry. There are kind of interlocking structures. Um, I also, like these are fairly large scale for me, I guess, you know, eight feet tall or something, 10 feet. And then, at the same time, I was doing much smaller, very, very compressed uh, pieces that I think are coming up next. So what you're seeing there is a kind of dichroic acrylic reflecting onto another surface. Um, oh, gee. So here's an editing mistake, but we'll just go with it. It's uh, this is going back a few years. Um, So this, this series, this is kind of the climax of a series of a kind of almost, not really substance abuse, but I guess I was thinking about the world in like kind of rearranged chemicals in different ways, um, and which are energy compulsions, uh, I guess. Been reading a lot about kind of obsessive compulsive uh, behavior. Kind of equating the way we self regulate with. Uh, with, for example, cigarettes or uh, the internet or the cell phone. I'm kind of looking at it, what I would consider a kind of unified, my unified theory of uh, obsessive compulsion. did a lot of, uh, over the years, a lot of combining of painting and video, whether it was in sculpture or not, and then sometimes really where it's just a kind of collage uh, with varying degrees of success. Because I think it's, there's a kind of um, inability to put the two together. Um, so this was carved into the gallery wall. 
very small house about this big. I left him right here. Keys, anyone, help me. Don't play me out, Mr. Brennan. Uh, I don't Aren't you able to see this? No. Understand what you need next. People to interact on a personal level. The love that is like your sexuality is expressed in all its complexities, and you may like this, but there is more to you than that. Don't get lost there. You have not been completed yet. The top levels won't be coming to focus when the lower needs are met. So this exhibition, there were like three of these little houses. <clears throat> I mean, it probably could have been, yeah, I'll just say it was two different exhibitions, but they happened to be in the same gallery. Um, <clears throat> maybe three different exhibitions. Um, and also these scratch cards, which is kind of a large, Actually, I think this is almost a scale right here. It was about that big. to know who actually designs these things, but I never did find out. So there's Tony again I with Constance Dijon. got a feeling in my belly that I want to be alone. If all this stuff is killing me, send it out. So this is the third house. Um, it's a kind of pho house of phobia. Thank <laughs> you. 
それ So uh, these are some of the micro abuses I was talking about, kind of smaller versions of those large installations. But this whole piece would be about, well, probably about this big. So that's an extreme close-up of it. Um, and there would be, you know, kind of sometimes, I don't know how many characters in it, but some of the same strategies of an approach to the materials, um, glass, uh, plastic, resin, but on a very small scale. And uh, editing these kind of cast of characters that loop sometimes talk to each other. Well, here's a, another, a bigger version. No. That's Joe, Joe Gibbons, Murray Lucier, Brandon Olson. This one even had some kinetic elements in it. Um, So that's another, this is another small piece about this big. So some of these things are found and some are made, you know, some of the glass figures are made. And <coughs> This video is wobbling a little bit, I'm not sure why, but... <laughs> so they even have special effects, explosions and... <laughs> Again. Yeah, sorry about the video. It's a little bit ragged, but it's the best I could do for this. Oh, so uh, then this is a piece that's a kind of new direction. It's almost the end of my presentation. It's a kind of a what I consider a kind of updated video wall in a landscape, a sort of video cave uh, with numerous flat screens uh, behind a kind of steel facade of apertures. 
And this is in a Eckenberg sculpture park in um, in Oslo. Um, so there's certain references to uh, to Nordic culture. American culture. So, <clears throat> the idea with this was that um, it connected to a couple of other pieces in the park, but uh, that there would be, uh, in the same way that the influence machine was in a temporary way in the park, that this would be in a permanent way. Um, so we're hoping that the winter doesn't completely destroy it. sure if they're looking at the naked people. <laughs> then here's, I guess, the last piece I'm going to show called uh, Phantasmagoria. And this is in Belgium. Um, so there's a long, long space with uh, a series of pieces kind of immersive, it had a kind of fun, fun house feeling to it. And the idea was to sort of take the notion of the original Phantasmagoria and update it to today, including the kind of first person uh, shooter games and um, psychology tests. And then I guess um, I'm just going to let this run and then you could do question and answers, whatever. These drawings were generated by uh, the education department at the museum um, and had to do with uh, kids' fantasies of fear. And then in, in the, the final aspect of this piece. These are probably 10 foot tall heads and it's the uh, it, you take a psychological test there, the uh, perceptual test called the flash face distortion test, which you can take on the internet. It doesn't really work here, but I really like the idea of actually doing some psychology test or perceptual test in installations. That's Jim Fletcher and Brandon Olson. Looks like he's been snorting blood. <laughs> So uh, I guess we could just sort of bring the lights up and uh, you can just let that play. <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, I think, Call of Duty. You could sit in, in the Call of Duty.
And then I just stuck this on the end, to kind of bookend it. This is a piece that's up now in, um, in Dusseldorf with, a, you know, it's kind of 20 years later, the exact strategy with the eyes, except they're bigger and clearer, and they have different, they have Facebook and things like that in them. So it's a kind of continuation of the, uh, that's Joe Gibbons' eye. So a lot of the, my friends keep appearing in the pieces, Constance, Tony, Joe Gibbons, and then new friends come in, Tracy Leipold, and, uh, and, and on like that. <clears throat> so I thought if there were any uh, questions, we could... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. How do you animate those? Is it like one projection or several? Yeah, that's, it's not really clear in there even how they're set up, uh, but the way that they're designed is there's a, a uh, let me just turn this off completely because I, I don't like that buzzing sound. Um, yeah, that, I use After Effects. There are people familiar with that, After Effects. It's... To me, it's a really an incredible program. It's an extension of uh, like Photoshop, I guess, but for the moving image. And it's, you know, I don't know how anybody ever really designed that program, but it's, uh, it's really deep and kind of incredible. Like, I yeah, just find it endless, but it's also quite difficult to use. But so we, it, use that in the studio and what I do is kind of feed through um, the projector onto the objects and then meticulously align um, the, the image onto the surface and then of course my job is to then kind of put the poetry back into it. Could you turn off the, uh, sound, the sound system? Uh, anyway, yeah, my axe. Yeah. Um, but so that's how those are done. And that projector is, of course, uh, well, that's the, the other one. <laughs> there we are, the dark and the light again. Uh, so, uh, y you know, the projector would be in a fixed position and. Uh, <clears throat> and so my, my problem with that is to just try to figure out in that kind of complicated editing how to retain the poetry, the performances, and things like that. And um, so I, I did those pieces for a couple of years, but then the editing was just too intense. So I had, now I'm back to like really simple pieces <laughs> because, you know, uh, yeah, it's just the, the yin and yang of, uh, of technology. Any other questions? Yeah. Did you or, I mean, do you or would you ever have anything like that like set up in your own house? <laughs> kind of like as a... I interesting question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I do have things around in my house, yeah. Yeah, and that's a question. I guess what you're asking is like, is it irritating for people? <laughs> is that it? Well, would yeah. it be irritating for you? No, obviously not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I know there's a kind of divide. And I think the divide is, you know, sound. And so often, like, I did some pieces with dolls and suitcases where they're kind of in suitcases. And there's a friend. Uh, or a collector that I knew who had one in their bedroom, you know, and I always thought it was very funny and uh, that they could stand to listen to the voice over and over. But what you're bringing up is an interesting uh, question. It's really at the, at the core of, uh, it's really at the core of multimedia and language. And I recently discovered that uh, you can't actually uh, look 
at a picture, and uh, you can't you can't actually read and uh, look at it at an image at the same time. So your brain is kind of switching on and off uh, on a neurological level between language and image all the time. So there's these kind of things that I've been working around intuitively uh, through the years making installations like, okay, there's the voice, like the talking light. You know, when, when I first put the talking light on, I was like, oh, that's, you know, I really liked it. It was a lot like HAL, the computer HAL in 2001. And, uh, you know, then I noticed that somebody else was like, shaking their head and like going, oh my God, that's irritating, you know, like, how could you stand that? Because not only is it the voice, but it's the light and the voice, you know. But I guess people switch these things on and off. And um, of course, people who uh, collected my work, I think they have a special relationship with that. They just probably turn the sound down when they don't want to hear it. You know? uh, <laughs> But I'm working on some paintings now and some graphics that have talk whispering voices in them. And I thought, okay, I dialed it in, they're perfect because you know, paint, paintings can't really talk to you this loud. Otherwise you would never want to look at it. Uh, but then I've been living with those for a while in the studio and even like whispering like this, you know, like my son comes in, he goes, Dad, can you turn that off? It's really creepy. It's creepy, you know. And me, I'm just ignoring it, but then I realize, well, maybe it is, I have to take it down. So I dial it in and out, you know, and uh, it's a balance. I also found that, you know, even in this documentation, sometimes the, the voice is not really highlighted uh, well in a lot of this, which I'm sorry about, because uh, when they're precise, they really get something across, and when they're mumbling, they're really just uh, subaqueous in a wonderful way for me, and they cause the viewer to even kind of maybe hallucinate, which I'm very interested in. Like, what did he say? Did they say that? Did they say this? So the language kind of dissolves. Uh, then, when I was working on this book that I was talking about that's coming out, that's out about now, um, I'm doing a reading uh, at the New York Public Library of different texts. And, you know, well, the year I was gathering it together because, you know, sometimes at different states of mind, you know, different years, I like had the text all carefully kept. Then other times I would like write the text and just rip it up and put it in a collage, you know, so I'd forget about it. It would go off in a piece. And I had different relationships to the text in my work. And I would mention to people, oh yeah, I've been really just killing myself getting this text together, this book of text. And I noticed that like half the people I mentioned, like when I said I was collecting my scripts, they went like, like what scripts? <laughs> what scripts? And I was like, oh, that's fantastic. Like, people just think the language is there. Like, it just got there. <laughs> it just came, or then it's not there at all. So people, I know people have a very weird relationship to the sound, and so I think a lot of people just shut it off, or they hear it and they, it becomes a symbol of something. You know, like, oh yeah, that's a crying, angry person or something, and then they just like, I can't listen to that. But uh, then other times I imagine that they listen to the finer poetic elements of it, but uh, and other times it probably drives them out of the room. But I thought it was really great that people just didn't even know it existed. So we'll see when people read the book, whatever that means, whatever reading is, uh, we'll see what they think of it. <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, but it's, you know, it's obviously an aggregation of image and text, which, um, or maybe that's the wrong word, although I like that word. It is a, a kind of fusion of the two. 
And as I mentioned, they, they, they cancel each other out. This is known neurologically, which is probably why people really hate image text photography. This is my theory. Because we all probably know certain conceptual artists who love that, and then other people who just shake their head like, oh no, not image text. <laughs> not that. Uh, so, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, it's, it varies. Sometimes they're fairly improvised, uh, but recently they're mostly written. And uh, so they, they, sometimes they'll come out of, like I mentioned, a lot of research. So I'll start re taking notes and then the notes actually become a kind of script, and they, but they happen at the same time. Then other times with the like micro pieces, the scripts began to write themselves because I started to think of each character as just part of the script. And when four or five of them got together, they would be saying something that I didn't actually write, which was obviously a kind of John Cage thing um, and very interesting to me. So I, I like that, that they would, you know, my, my secret fantasy was that one day I would just walk in and these things would be saying something else that I had nothing to do with. And, <clears throat> but you can reach that through appropriation too, which I, I have done a little bit of with the MMPI, Minneapolis Multiphasic Personality Inventory. And so that when I write, I, I find a lot of uh, sources, you know, primary, secondary. Someone else, had, you had a question? Yeah, you brought up the thought systems and spiritualism. You know, which it's kind of interesting because it was trying to scientifically prove the unseeable in the spirit world. But, it, but back to your research about cinema and like the, the glowing orb, I'm just wondering about um, the invisible in, in your work or, or the invisible in culture and when it disappears with with cinema. Uh, it, it, I'm not sure what you, you're meaning, but like about which invisible. Uh, well, just that. <coughs> I like it. The medieval, you know, the medieval times, I guess, of, you know, I just looked through this in detail, but the, the invisible was very part of people's lives, whether it was spirits or ghosts oh, okay. or stories or. And then we have these technologies that then make the invisible visible, and then we may potentially lose the invisible. Yeah, that's, that's a great, that's very uh, interesting line of thought. Yeah, I, I mean, that, that's probably in essence what I think separates pop culture from art. So uh, pop culture, as much as I like the idea of crossover, of, you know, trying to, to work in super popular um, ways. Um, I still think that when people go to a Hollywood movie, it's really just about shutting them off, which I like a lot too. I do it a lot, but I, I, you know, there, I always think of it, you know, because there's a big confusion, like artists think, oh yeah, that they could, their art could be as popular as, as a Hollywood movie or something like this. But um, in fact, the strategies are really different. Like it's really about the audience having their own opinion in art. And, and in uh, pop culture, it's really about you being replaceable, re infinitely replaceable by the next person. And it's an economic structure that has to do with escapism. And um, so I think that's a big difference because I think what artists, what I'm assuming that most people in this audience are artists, what they're doing, it's important to know what the difference is. Like what we're doing is not the same as that. It's really about a different uh, space for, for an audience to go into. And what you're bringing up is about the invisible alt and visibility is a kind of metaphor, I would guess, for uh, a kind of intangible 
that art's trying to make. Like you can't actually, it's never gonna be visible. You know, like my work is never done. It's never fully articulated. It's always completed by somebody else. And I know that. And, and I think that in, you know, when you have a, a the, this kind of an image that's laid bare, it's, a, it's about something else. It's about kind of ending it, you know? That's why people are not satisfied with popular culture, and that's why they have to have art too. Otherwise, we'd be gone, I guess. That's why we don't want to have uh, you completely satisfy everybody here tonight. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks everybody for coming. Come again next year. Yeah. <laughs> Come next year. <laughs>